All righty, we will now begin our uh, third and final panel. Thanks for everybody for being here. Um, we will get to our distinguished panelists, but first I am gonna introduce the moderator, John Hood. Um, John is the president of the William, or the John William Pope Foundation. He is the, uh, serves on the board at the John Locke Foundation where he champions the E.A. Morris program, which is a great fellowship program for um, young professionals uh, who are interested in leadership. I would definitely recommend that. John is a distinguished NC journalist uh, in politics, and he's a nonfiction writer of books. And uh, as of late, he has recently he has uh, taken his hand to fiction writing. You can find his book called Mountain Folk, which uh, I describe as the genre of first principles fantasy. So, without further ado, please welcome John Hood to the stage. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, some would say I've always been writing fiction and fantasy. <laughs> all right. So I want to thank you all uh, he, for being here and for this important event. I want to thank the North Carolina Lawyer Chapters of the Federalist Society for putting this event together and for ma asking me to moderate it. It's so very important that we spotlight and showcase our judicial races here in North Carolina. In 2022, we will be choosing two members of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Of course, we'll be talking about that today, and also four members of the Court of Appeals. I'm delighted that all four candidates for our two Supreme Court races are joining us. Candidates, thank you very much. Um, and audience, thank you so much for sig signaling how important you believe this to be. I know you all, of course, know that we elect our appellate judges, but many North Carolinians don't know that. So it's important for all of us to encourage our friends and our family members to do their homework, to notice that there are other races on the ballot, and to be prepared for that. My mission as moderator today is to give voters more information about who the candidates are, what views or philosophies may drive their decisions. We'll do our best to leave time for questions from the audience in a little while, and to that point, you will find some cards on your table. So if you have a question or a question occurs to you over the course of our conversation, please write the card, write it on the card, and how are we going to collect them? People will mysteriously take the cards from your hand. You won't even know it. They're law students. They're like, they're like secret agents. Here's how the forum's going to work. Each candidate will have uh, an opening statement of one minute. Then we will, I will be posing a set of questions to the candidates. We'll have about 10 minutes for each of the two races for the candidates to answer questions from me. Then we will pose questions from the audience. And then finally, there will be an opportunity for, e to, for each of our candidates to present two minutes of closing thoughts. So let's go ahead and get started with opening remarks. And let us begin with Judge Lucy Inman. She's the Democratic candidate for Associate Justice, seat three on the court. Judge Inman, welcome. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this forum. My name is Lucy Inman. My first experience in a courtroom was as a newspaper reporter. I soon realized in that job that courts are where individuals meet their government on a daily basis, and I wanted to participate in the justice system. So I went to law school, and after clerking for two years at the North Carolina Supreme Court, I practiced civil litigation for 18 years, and then I served for four years as a Superior Court judge all across North Carolina. In 2014, I was elected in a statewide nonpartisan election to the North Carolina Court of Appeals, and I'm in my eighth year there, I'm running for the Supreme Court to continue my state service and to protect our Supreme Court from partisan politics that threatens the, the independence of each justice and the court itself. I look forward to answering your questions and thank you for having me. Next is Judge Richard Dietz. Uh, he is the Republican candidate for Associate Justice C3. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the Federal Society for organizing this forum. So I'm Richard Dietz, and it's been a privilege to have served uh, for eight years on the Court of Appeals, and now I'm running um, for the open seat on the Supreme Court. And I've made the theme of my campaign leadership for the courts, and I'll tell you what that means. So I think first, leadership means having 
the skills to do the work of a Supreme Court justice. And as many of you know, I spent my entire legal career in what they call issues and appeals, so the kinds of complex, groundbreaking cases that are the ones that go to the Supreme Court. Um, but as I think you'll hear more during this forum, I think leadership is more than that. Uh, leadership also means being able to show the public that judges are public servants, uh, not politicians. So reinforce that idea of judicial independence. And then I think importantly, leadership is about going beyond the courtroom and seeing what judges can do to help educate the public and help improve access to courts. And uh, as I hope as I talk to you tonight, you're going to hear more about that and get excited uh, to watch me join our state's highest court in the November election. So thank you all again. Thank you, Judge Dietz. Next is Trey Allen. He is the Republican candidate for seat five on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Good evening, everyone. I am Trey Allen. Thanks so much to the Federalist Society for hosting this event. Uh, I currently serve as the general counsel for our state's court system. Uh, in that role, I give legal guidance to court officials around the state. I'm on leave from the UNC Chapel Hill School of Government, where I'm a, a tenured professor uh, who focuses on uh, various aspects of local government law. Uh, before that, uh, I practiced law and was a partner at a Raleigh law firm where I litigated constitutional law claims and other civil claims in state court and federal court at the trial level and at the appellate level. Before that, I had the uh, honor of clerking for a, a state Supreme Court justice. Uh, he was the newbie on the court at that time. He's now your Chief Justice. Uh, I began my legal career uh, in the United States Marine Corps, serving four and a half years. Most of that was overseas. I did do a tour uh, of duty uh, in Iraq. I'm running to bolster the public's faith in our courts as institutions that make decisions even in and especially in the important cases based on law, not politics. If I'm elected to the North Carolina Supreme Court, that's exactly what I'll do my best to do. Thank you. Next is Justice Sam Urban IV. He is the Democratic candidate and the incumbent for seat five. Thank you, John, and thanks to the members of the Federalist Society. I've always enjoyed coming to these gatherings in the past. It's good to see so many, so many folks here, and I hope that you'll learn something about the candidates tonight. I've been in the court system now for almost 40 years in some capacity or other. I think probably I'm as known a quantity as you're likely to find. I'm a native of Morganton in the western end of the state. I still live there. I'm a product of the public schools in Burke County. Graduated from Davidson College, magna cum laude, then graduated from Harvard Law School, cum laude, in 1981. Practiced law in Morganton for almost 18 years doing a general civil and criminal and administrative trial practice, and also did a lot of appellate work before the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. In 1999, I became a member of the North Carolina Utilities Commission, which is a quasi-judicial body that functions very much like a court. Served on that body for almost 10 years then was elected to the Court of Appeals in 2008, had the privilege of serving on that body for almost for six years before being elected to the Supreme Court in 2015. It's been the privilege of my life to serve on the Supreme Court. Very few people get the opportunity to do that. And I think the job of an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court is pretty simple. We decide specific cases. Our job is to take the facts of the case, which are mostly developed in the trial court, and apply the, the law as we see it to those facts in an attempt to produce a, just, a judgment that's fair, that's impartial, that treats everybody equally under the law, and that does not stem from some sort of political or ideological agenda. I've got a record, I think, of doing exactly what I say should be done, and I appreciate the chance to talk about that and other subjects this evening. Thank you very much, John. Now we're going to proceed to our panels. The way we're going to do this is we're going to have uh, Judge Inman and Judge Dietz answer some questions together, and then our other two candidates answer questions together later. Some of the questions may be similar, some may be not. We'll see what whim strikes me. <laughs> now keep in mind this is a conversation, so feel free to uh, add in, agree. You can in fact agree on things, it's shocking but true, but also feel free to disagree. <laughs> I'll try to keep the speaking times roughly balanced. Here we go. So the first question. Section 35 of the Declaration of Rights in the North Carolina Constitution states, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. This is a question for both candidates. 
What does that statement mean to you? Let's start with Judge Inman. Sure. Well, um, a frequent recurrent to fundamental principles um, means to me. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All this year, all this time in a pandemic, and I still don't know how to unmute myself. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, what that means to me is there are fundamental principles that we have to keep in mind and we return to whenever we consider any case. Um, that's the basis for the consistency of a court's opinions. And I don't mean a consistency in result. I mean a consistency in methodology. Um, that goes to me to canons of interpretation. It goes to the fundamental principles that are provided in our state constitution and, and remaining true to those in every case, going back to those in every case, whether it's a driving while impaired case or a multi-million dollar business dispute. Judge Dietz, what does that phrase mean to you? So is that I think the folks who are in this room heard in an uh, earlier panel, uh, I just finished a paper about the state constitution and I actually looked into this provision. I, I think it's uh, really wonderful that what that means is uh, this was the framers of our state constitution um, who were inspired by the principles of the enlightenment, reminding us that we should return over and over to those ideas of the enlightenment that are the foundation of the liberties that we have here in North Carolina. So these are ideas like rational thinking and open discourse and debate. The things that we're trained as lawyers that are so important, and that I also think are important for society at large. Um, so I think there's a lesson in our state constitution, an inspirational one, um, even in divisive times like we have today, about how important it is to hearken back to those ideas that were sort of at the founding of our nation, the idea that we can get together, have that debate, have that open discourse, that we can enjoy free speech, and that we can let the marketplace of ideas, let the good ideas rise to the top, you know, that we can come together as a society and reach a consensus. And I also think it's useful to keep that in mind as judges, because one of the things that's so important about our job as judges is that we have to be able to see all sides of everything. Um, and it, uh, I think it can be challenging for some people to understand how important that is for us as judges, but we set aside all of our personal preferences and views, and we listen to every argument and weigh them and see which argument is the one that should prevail. And um, so again, I think in that, that provision sort of can be inspiration for judges about the role that we are doing as enlightenment thinkers, about understanding all of those different perspectives. All right, next question, and we'll start with Judge Dietz this time. Do you believe it's appropriate to use legislative history or evidence about the purpose of a statute in order to interpret the statute? Or do you believe the meaning of the statute should be determined based on its words and phrases without a regard to attempt to d divine the purpose of it? Do you think these modes of interpretation give appellate judges room to lean on their policy preferences in interpreting the statute? Yeah, so if you, if you read my opinions, you'll see that I've certainly fallen on the side of, of believing that when we look at laws, what we need to do is look at the words that are chosen by lawmakers. And, and I'll, uh, the way that I explain it, I teach a um, a course over the summer, an appellate seminar to law students, and I talk to them about the ways that judges can interpret statutes. And what I, what I explain to them is that um, sometimes you may look at a written law and say, um, wow, there seems to be a loophole in here. Uh, you know, I can see what the legislature must have been trying to accomplish, but if you read the law, there's a loophole that means people can do something else and the law's not working. Um, and it's easy to get misled into this idea that, well, uh, lawmakers, legislators are angels, and they could only have been intending to you know, ha have some wonderful policy when they enact it. And we forget that sometimes in order to have the votes to make a law, the law might not be perfect. And our job as judges is to enforce the law as it's written and not to try to imagine, oh, if, you know, if the lawmakers were trying to achieve something else, let's find a way to read these words uh, to make that work. So um, I'll occasionally look at legislative history to sort of see what was going on uh, in this law. But when I uh, interpret the law, I look to the text um, because that's, I think, our obligation of t as judges is to see what the law says, what the words that are written in the law say, and it's up to the lawmakers to be the ones to write a law that's clear. Uh, and if it's, if it's ambiguous, if we can't understand that, um, then we need to tell the lawmakers you need to go back and do a better job uh, writing that law. Judge Inman. Um, you know, we agree with each other on a few things, and this is one of them. Um, and, and I'll, but I'll say it in the way I see it, and that is, um, to me, every interpretation 
of a statute begins with the text of the statute. And if you're looking at a subsection of the statute, it begins with that subsection. And if the, if the words in that law that you're looking at are clear, there is absolutely no reason to look anywhere else, including um, legislative history, in my view. Um, of course, sometimes a phrase or a word that is absolutely clear to one judge is absolutely clear to another judge and it means something different. That's when we have the harder cases. Um, I think the next place I look is to the words and the phrases in the, in the surrounding sections. You, you still stay within this text of what the legislature wrote in order to honor what the legislature has written. Um, I think that legislative history you know, may be interesting, but I think it can also be dangerous to read legislative history in the sense that you know, you, we go through many drafts as judges of opinions, but it's only the final opinion that is what the court has written. And um, I think that legislative history, like other extrinsic sources, can, you have to really be careful in looking at that um, to think that you can discern what the legislature intended. Well, just to play devil's advocate, not that I've ever done that before, um, isn't it possible if you had a statute that was written long ago, not five years ago or 10 years ago, but 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that the words and phrases used had a different meaning to them than it might be to us. And so if you're just focusing on the text and not on the context in which some of that text was chosen, then you might end up misinterpreting the statute because the language we use today is different from the, language, the way we've used the same English language like 100 years ago. I think there's a burden on legislators, and it's not a light burden, to be very careful in writing the law and thinking about how it's going to be applied. But yes, I think you have a point there. And certainly, I don't think that uh, legislative history is something that we should just lazily say we don't need to look at. But I'm, I'm cautious about it because judges could also disagree about what the lead, what the context meant those many years ago. Judge Dietz? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I just think you're right. What you need to do is look at what those words meant uh, to the lawmakers who enacted the law. Um, that, that's what's important. In fact, th this is in constitutional interpretation, but I encountered this when looking at our state constitution. There's a wonderful clause that says monopolies are against the genius of a free state and shall not be allowed. And um, when I was looking into it, I realized what a monopoly means. You know, we all sort of know what that means today. I think even children understand it, you know, because if you're playing Monopoly and you manage to land on Boardwalk and Park Place at the same time, whoever else comes around to those squares is going to have to pay a lot of money, right, to, to stay there. So we have this sense of, oh, you dominate the market. But it turns out the word Monopoly uh, in 1776 in our first Constitution, it meant something different to the people of our state. Then. And I think that's the sort of thing you do need to always check into that and understand that principle because it's what the people who wrote the law understood those words to mean that matters. All right, <clears throat> next question for Judge Edmund first. Supreme Court races are partisan, as we've noted already today. You're a registered Democrat. You're the Democratic nominee for the seat. What should voters take away from that piece of information about you, if anything? Um, what they should take away from that first is that, um, as you know, the, the legislature made these races partisan in 2015. Um, there may be of some judges who asked for that. I don't know of any. And um, in order to now run for judge, if you do not identify as a Democrat or a Republican, you have to overcome a significant barrier to entry in the marketplace by getting petitions signed, um, names signed on a petition. Um, so what people should take away from that is that I have identified as a Democrat and I'm a lifelong Democrat. Um, and I don't believe anything more than that. Um, when I ran in 2014 and again in 2022, um, but more so then, it was easier, I was proud to have the support of many respected retired judges and lawyers who were Republicans. Um, since the law has changed to make these races partisan, 
people tend to see that label and I think that it's unfortunate because I'm a person, not a partisan. Judge Deed, same question. You're the Republican nominee. What should voters take away from that, if anything, uh, from your partisan identification? Yeah, I, I actually think there's not much to take away from that. I think the idea is if we're doing our jobs as judicial candidates, we have a message about what we're going to bring uh, to the court, and that's what voters need to look at. And I think when you ask people, uh, overwhelmingly, I hear the idea that the public wants nonpartisan judges. Um, but what they mean by that is we don't want judges involved in partisan politics. Uh, we, want, we think of judges as people that are outside politics, and they're right. That's what judges should be. And so I think part of the challenge is I hear a lot of people that are focused on this idea that the party labels are, are back on the ballot and um, as a reason to engage in sort of partisan politicking in running judicial campaigns. I think we need to do the opposite. We need to rise above that and say it's not about a party label, it's about what we do as judges. And what we do is focus on judicial independence and the idea that we have a message about, um, first of all, being able to decide cases fairly, to be impartial and uphold the law, and then second, about how we can be leaders uh, in the courtroom and beyond the courtroom and the other things that the public really cares about. Um, for example, one thing I hear from the public a lot is how expensive it is to get legal help. And that's something that, uh, that we can be leaders on as, as members of the judiciary and help find solutions. And I think when the public says that's a judge working on these things that I care about, that's why they want to vote for that judge. Um, and I think that's what matters and not the partisan politics. All right, I got one final question for you two, and that is what court opinion that you have written, or perhaps just an opinion that you didn't write but admire, is the best representation of your judicial philosophy and your approach to jurisprudence? Gosh, so many. It's like asking someone seconds. to pick their, it's like asking someone to pick their favorite child, you know. Um, well, one opinion that comes to mind um, was called um, the board, State Board of Education versus the Rules, North Carolina Rules Review Commission. And this was a, a, a constitutional case of first impression in which the State Board of Education asserted that because it had been identified as an as a, as a entity in our state constitution starting in 1868, and that in the ver first version of the constitution it said, shall legislate for what is right for, for schools, that the Rules Review Commission, which is part of the Administrative Procedures Act, and will s say to the Board of Education, you want to have a rule, you don't get to just make it. We have to review it. Sometimes that review would take a while. This was very frustrating. And the Board of Education said, the legislature does not have the authority to hold up our rulemaking because we're an independent and foundational part of this state. Um, after a lot of historical research about our Constitution, from 1868 and then in the 30s and then in the 70s, um, I came to the conclusion that the Constitution had changed so that the, the word legislate had been removed from the description of what the Board of Education could do. And therefore, the legislature of North Carolina did have the authority to require the rules that were made by the Board of Education to be approved by the Rules Review Commission. Um, it was a fascinating case to work on because of all the historical research. Um, and at the same time, just those simple, the word legislate is taking, taken out, um, was also a reminder that if you just look at text, if you just look at text, um, and I can think of all sorts of policy reasons why the Board of Education was very frustrated, but that's not something that I could decide. That's something that's, that's in our Constitution and for our legislature to decide. Judge Dietz. So uh, one case I know that um, some scholars have written about that as an example of the way that I approach um, constitutional interpretation is called Common Cause versus Forest. And it was a fascinating case because it was about some legislation that was enacted by our General Assembly um, in a special session. And it happened very quickly um, over the course of, I think, just 48 hours. And so the question was about, there's a provision from our original constitution in 1776 um, that guarantees the right of the, of the people to instruct their representatives. And so this was actually the case, this was just two years ago, 
but it was the first time from 1776 till 2020 that uh, the courts had ever examined what does this language mean. And my approach to it uh, was to say, well, we start with the idea of, uh, we focus on the concept of we the people. So I'm looking at when this provision was added into our state constitution, you know, what did it mean then? And we traced it through from 1776 all the way to our third constitution in 1971, and ultimately concluded, if you look at where it was located, along with two other protections um, for the right to assemble and the right to petition the government, we said what this right to instruct meant is open access to the legislative process. So um, our lawmakers can't do things in secret. Um, they have to tell you that they're getting together to pass laws. And there has to be an opportunity for you to communicate uh, with your legislators about what's going on. And we looked at the record in the case and said, well, that happened because everybody knew there was a special session. In fact, there were protests and there was a lot of media coverage and the opportunity for people to communicate with their legislators about whether they opposed or supported uh, what our lawmakers were doing. And so we said, this satisfies what we think we the people intended when we said you have a right to instruct your representatives. Thank you. So thank you, thank you to both of you. And now we're going to direct some questions towards Mr. Allen and Justice Irvin. And here's the first question for you. More and more, our society seems to be focused on whether something is deemed fair or just, not just whether it might be legal or illegal, constitutional or unconstitutional. Is it better for a judge to remain detached from the personal effects of a case, or is it better to express compassion to those affected? In other words, is it appropriate for a judge to try to right social injustices? And is that something that you would seek to do or have done on the court? Let's start with Mr. Allen, and then we'll go to Justice Irvin. Thank you. So we traditionally portray Lady Justice as blindfolded. And I think that that image captures an important understanding about the limits of what courts can do. Courts are not equipped to right all of society's ills. They have to take issue by issue, case by case, party by party. What courts are charged with doing is providing justice, equal justice under law under law, and that recognizes, that, that phrase, that under law part is very important because it recognizes that there is a, a limit on the authority of courts uh, when they uh, have to decide a matter. Uh, of course, a, a judge is a human being, and a judge is going to have compassion uh, for people who are in difficult circumstances. But uh, for our system of government to, to function, in the way it's supposed to, if we're to be faithful to those fundamental principles that are mentioned in uh, Article 1, Section 35, our judges have to resist the temptation to, to really abuse the power that they've been given to decide cases to instead go out and write laws. What people are entitled to when they come to court is a judge who's going to treat them the same way that judge would treat another person uh, in, in a case that involved the same facts and not show favoritism based on race or, or wealth or religion or any other factor that's not relevant to the matter uh, at hand. Because this is an imperfect world, uh, our justice system is necessarily imperfect. Our, our founders believed that the closest our courts can get to justice is a system in which the law is applied equally to everyone. Justice Servant. My, my father was a state superior court judge and a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit for almost 20 years. He was the thir about 13 years on the superior court. He used to say to me and to my brother that judges did not have what he described as a, quote, roving commission to do justice. At first blush, that sounds kind of strange to lots of people, but what he meant by that was that we don't have the responsibility for righting all societal wrongs. That is not the job of a court. I don't think that uh, anybody with a law license pretends to the contrary. And therefore, the answer, specific answer to your question is the same one from me that Mr. Allen gave, which is we are a court of law our job is to make sure that the laws are applied equally to everybody. 
But he also went on to say something else. He said that it was important to understand the consequences of what one does as a judge. And the reason that it was important to understand those consequences was not because you should make a decision based upon your emotional reaction to the circumstances that a particular litigant found themselves in. Instead, what he continually reminded me was that we are engaged in a very, very, very serious business. That what we do has significant impact on the lives of the people whose cases come before us for decision. And so while it is not appropriate to take the circumstances that a person finds themselves in and then make a decision to try to arrive at some abstract just outcome, it is important to understand what circumstances the litigants find themselves in because we need to take what we do very, very, very seriously. And one way to do that is to remember and remember and remember and remember that what we do has consequences, it has real effects on the lives of real people, and that we had better take our job seriously. All right, the next question will go to you first, Justice Irvin. Um, how would you describe your view, your view on stare decisis? What rules guide your decision on when to override an established precedent? Well, obviously, as a common law jurisdiction, North Carolina adheres to the doctrine of stare decisis, and there's very good reason for that. We have laws so that people will understand what conduct they can engage in without running afoul of the legal sanction. And so therefore, if the law is unclear, then people are fundamentally uncertain about what they can or can't do. And such uncertainty is inimical, inimical to the ability of people to live their lives, particularly in a complex society like ours. I think I learned this lesson when I was on the Utilities Commission probably most thoroughly because in many instances what the business leaders who were involved in those cases would say sometimes was it didn't matter so much what the decision was. What mattered was first of all that it was clear and secondly that it was applied consistently because if you had a clear decision that was consistently applied you could know what you were supposed to do. So stare decisis is a really, really important doctrine. My grandfather, when he was on the state Supreme Court, wrote a decision called State versus Balance, which I think is still perhaps the best discussion of this question of any decision that the courts handed down. And he talked that he said in effect, first of all, that no decision uh, is graven in stone to the extent that it can never be looked at again but that you need to adhere to stare decisis in all but the most extraordinary circumstances for the reason that I just said. But he also had a line in there that said something like that there is no virtue against sinning against the light. And that therefore you had to on occasion consider, and he did in that case consider, whether a former or earlier case ought to be overruled and did so. But he said that that should only be done in very, very clear instances and only in the event that the court was convinced that it was wrong, and it also needed to take into consideration what would be the effect of a change in the law upon the rights, responsibilities, and obligations that people had to each other. So stare decisis is really important. You need to adhere to it in all but the most unusual circumstances, and if you decide that you are not going to follow a particular decision, you would better have a really good reason for doing it. Same question, Mr. Allen. So there's no rule of law without stability in the law. And stare decisis is a very important doctrine for, that promotes stability in the law and therefore the rule of law. I do think that the extent to which or the degree to which stare decisis uh, or the, the, the weight that it should be given depends in part on the kind of case that the court's considering. Uh, stare decisis, I think, is at its strongest when you're talking about uh, a, a common law precedent or a court's interpretation of a statute. And the reason that it's strongest in the case of a court's interpretation of a statute is because if the court gets it wrong, well, the legislature can, can pretty easily fix that and let the court know it was wrong through amending uh, the law. Uh, Star decisis is also very important uh, in the context of constitutional law cases 
But I think our courts have been a little more willing to re-examine constitutional law precedents precisely because if the court gets it wrong in a case involving a constitutional issue, there's no easy way to fix that. That's not something the legislature uh, can, can, can remedy in, in, in the next session. Uh, so uh, I, I, I would go on to say that, that when you're considering or when a court's considering uh, whether to uh, overturn a precedent, I think it should look at factors uh, including the, the quality of the reasoning in the decision at issue. Is it persuasive? Um, the workability of that case, have, is it still something that, that makes sense to apply in what are perhaps changed circumstances? And then reliance. To what extent